Hey guys, welcome to episode 403 of Hillbilly Horror Stories. I'm Jerry. And I'm Tracy. Tracy, as normal, we want to start off thanking all of our military and civil servants all over the world, no matter which country you represent. Thanks to all you men, women, and service animals for everything you do and to keep us safe on a regular basis. And I know you guys have really been putting in some overtime mm-hmm. in the U.S. this week from everything from tornadoes to floods to uh, fires. It's been crazy. Yeah, it has been a little weird around here, but we're thankful for you guys and for everything that you do. We know you work your butts off, and it's a, a tireless job, but we love you guys. We pray for you all the time. Thank you again. Tracy, we had a message from somebody the other day that just wanted to thank us. I think it was even a review, maybe, uh, that just wanted to thank us for giving out the the suicide hotline every week, the crisis line, and just uh, reminding people that it's okay to not be okay. Well, good. I'm glad that they appreciate that because we love to, you know, give that number out. We love to give um, our group out for people to talk to and it's as far as that goes jerry and i we have our phone numbers that we can give to you if you want to talk to us so we just encourage you guys to reach out to somebody because always somebody will be there for you you can also call the crisis hotline at 988 you can text 741-741 so reach out guys we love you and tracy tonight we've got a special guest after we finish with this episode wc fillmore He is a a horror author, and he's got some very cool stories for us. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah, so we can't uh, can't wait for you guys to hear that. All right, so Tracy, it's been a long time since we've done an episode on haunted ships. And I think I've got a few great stories from the sea tonight for you guys. All right. Let's hear it. Tracy, I don't know if ghost ships such as the Flying Dutchman exist, but I do believe that ships can be haunted, and they got ghosts on them, such as the Queen Mary. I know that that's a a very famous haunted ship, the USS Hornet, uh, just to name a few. And that's what we're going to talk about on tonight's episode. We're going to at least focus on two different stories that supposedly are haunted ships. Sounds good. All right. Don't let that wire cut your neck in half, though. Yeah. Or cut your head off. That is disturbing. I still cannot get over that. I know I've said that before, but it just is so disturbing. It's a good movie, though. I know, but yuck. All right, so let's face it. There's a lot of tragedy at sea. So it makes sense that, uh, you know, there would be haunted ocean liners out there. True. So we're going to start with a ship called the SS Great Eastern. And you talk about a ship that was plagued by death. No. My goodness. No. Don't sound good. (laughs) So the Great Eastern was the marvel of its time. It was actually built in 1857, and there was nothing like that ship that had ever existed when it was created. It was 680 feet long, and for the record... That was five times larger than any other ship at its time. Oh, my gosh. It's so, it's so weird to believe that that can, like, sail. Well, not sail, but you know what I'm saying. Right. With it being so huge that it can stay afloat like that. That's what she said. hmm Just for the record, the Titanic was 883 feet long. So, the Titanic was bigger, but just to give you an idea of how big this was. All right. Well, and it did sink, so there's no. my point. <laughs> This ship could actually hold 4,000 passengers and 400 crew members. Wow. Twice that of any other ship. I wonder why it was five times bigger, but could only hold twice the amount of customers. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Customers. Well, it was, had to have room for the innards of all the things in the ship. It was powered by a complex system of paddle wheels, propellers, and sails. So this one actually had true life sails on it as well. Oh, Wow. It was built in London, and it took three and a half years and 2,000 men to construct it. So the ship was the brainchild of the most famous shipbuilder of the time, a gentleman by the name of Isambard Brunel. Now, he was nicknamed the Little Giant Hmm. for all the stuff that he had accomplished. Nice. His company 
the Great Western Railway Company dominated the world when it came to ships and railway and stuff like that. It's funny that his railway company built the biggest ship. I know, right? The Great Eastern was supposed to be his crowning achievement. Instead, it became a ship of doom. I should have put some scary music behind that. The issues started the very first day that the ship was launched. As it moved down the dry dock toward the waters, this might sound familiar to you, a mooring cable snapped and flew through the air, killing two people. Oh, you know that hurt. Well, you know, to come to think about it, you have sails, you have uh, wheels, or whatever you call that thing, to turn the water, I guess. Paddle wheels. Paddle wheels. It just seems like a bunch of hodgepodge. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, have you ever seen um, sails on a paddle wheel boat? No. no. See what I'm saying? Okay, go ahead. So they went ahead and launched the ship anyway. But even though it was launched, it still wasn't complete as far as the work being done. Crews continued to work on it while carpenters were finishing the deck. The riveters worked on the Great Eastern's most unique feature, its double hull. That was an innovation in the day. Okay. Engineers believed that this dual layer of iron would actually make the ship safer. Instead, this became an integral part of the ship's mysterious haunting. Well, wait. So, you said the first day that happened. Was that the first day they just took it for a test drive? Or did they was there actually people on it? They don't take test drives. Well, you know what I'm saying. This is not a Toyota dealership. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It did it have passengers on it since it was no. the first day? Okay. No. Okay, sorry. No, they do do trial runs okay. and stuff with them. So, two of the riveters that were working on this hole went missing. So, it was initially believed that the two men may have accidentally sealed themselves <gasps> into the hole. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The crew searched all over the place for the two riveters. But they were never found. Did, couldn't they not bang on something and say, hey? Well, you would think that would be the case. Oh, my Lord, that's terrible. The riveters were soon forgotten because, you know, that's what happens. Time goes on. But the ship's troubles were just getting started. So on the very first sea trial, which is their mm -hmm. test run, a boiler blew up. Three men died instantly. Oh, my Lord. Another jumped overboard to avoid the explosion. He died. Because he was crushed by the ship's paddles. On okay, the paddle this is really upsetting. Because why in the world would he these? Ugh. Well, you're not thinking about that. You don't have time to sit there and analyze. Well, if I jump off the boat, no, 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 an I explosion. Don't, no, I don't mean that. I mean all the stuff that's already happened, and you haven't even run out to the middle of the sea yet. <laughs> I mean, I would think that would be enough to say, you know what, we need to to. to Think about this again, because things aren't going right. But well, he kept on going, I guess. Another five people were scalded. Ah. Oh. The ship dropped anchor, and the captain ordered the rest of the crew to jump inside the dinghy, and they were going to roll that to shore. But the dinghy overturned, <laughs> and all five of the people were drowned. I mean, this is almost laughable at this point, and not in a good way. No, I get what it is. It almost seems unbelievable. Yeah. So, of course, the stories of the ship being haunted started to make its rounds. So much so that on its very first Atlantic trip, even though it could hold 4,000 passengers, there were only 35 paying customers. And we all know how superstitious people can be, especially in the 1800s. The ship was definitely looked at as cursed. But that was especially true when it came to sailors and ships themselves. If anything went awry with a ship, it was always looked at like a voodoo ship, so to speak. So people were afraid to sail on the ship after all the previous mishaps. It was on that very first trip that the haunting of the Great Eastern began. So passengers and crew started to hear noises. 
noises like moans and groans and shouts. An inspection turned up absolutely nothing. And when the Great Eastern arrived in New York with the frightened passengers on board the ship, the problems continued. Because you see, when the ship was docking, the paddle wheels on it demolished five feet of the dock. It completely split the dock in half. Two inspectors, they came down to look at the damage. Both of those inspectors fell overboard and drowned. Well, I don't even know what to say at this point. I mean, shouldn't there be a time when you should know how to swim, especially if you're working around water? You would think so. So some sailors came down. They were drunk. And they also fell overboard and one of them drowned. The ship was obviously cursed for everybody involved. Passengers, crew, inspectors, and even bystanders and the owner. Remember, we said that this was supposed to be his crowning achievement, this ship. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, during the ship's first year at sea, he would suffer two strokes and pass away. Wow. Well, you know, he had a lot on his shoulders there, a bunch of people passing away. I guess the stress must have got to him pretty bad. Maybe so. The few passengers that dared to travel on his ship were subjected to horrific moments of banging, yelling, and moaning. And with all of that moaning, they thought this could possibly be the missing riveters. Yeah, but they've been... Passed away. I mean, they've been dead for a month, right? Right, so this would have to be like a like ghostly moan. Like yeah. their ghostly moan? So the moaning was actually coming from inside the hull, which would make sense. Tracy, we're going to fast forward a little bit to 1860. While the ship was dropping anchor right outside of New York, the Great Eastern encountered more bad luck. In this incident, a rock gashed its outer hull. So they brought in a crew of riveters to fix the damage. But while the crew was down under there working on the ship, they heard a tapping sound. And trust me, these men know the story of the two men that were missing, you know, that were riveters back uh-huh. in the day. They know this story. They felt like this might have been the ghost tapping on the hull. So they came right back up and refused to work on the ship. Oh, I don't blame them. In 1866, an investigator by the name of Cyrus Beagle bought the ship at a bargain price. Why in the world would he do that? Well, probably because he saw things. That he, he looked past the superstition and just looked at what the actual things are. If you don't believe in a cursed ship or the paranormal, then... But yeah, but so many things happened. The... the thing blew up the bad luck you know he got a good deal on it and he actually had success with the ship honestly the great eastern was an intricate part of a very huge event three thousand miles of coiled steel was actually loaded into the inside of the its massive hull the ship then proceeded to lay the very first transatlantic cable now this was a telegraph cable and it allowed the U.S. and Great Britain to communicate much easier. Okay, I'm going to sound stupid. Underwater? The cable underwater? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Now, this was initially supposed to be just for government and military, but eventually immigrants were allowed to use it to communicate with their families across the ocean. Okay, that's nice. The ship crossed the ocean five times without any incidents. (laughs) I bet what's-his-name was pissed off in in the afterlife. Well, once the ship was finished laying its cable, Bill put the ship up for auction. The French government bought it with the intent of turning it into a luxury liner. Uh Uh-oh. That didn't work out well. The Great Eastern sailed only once, and the trip ended in a financial disaster. Fast forward again to May of 1889. The ship was sold to an English group for scrap. (laughs) After 30 years and 33 deaths, the ship was now going to be scrapped. 
The workers who had the job of tearing the ship apart, which was a massive job, as you can imagine, they started fighting amongst themselves. And there was a little bit of a mutiny, which led to the death of one of the workers when he was hit over the head by another co-worker. Dang. Okay, so if they tore the thing apart, did they find the Slow remain? down, Mabel. Oh. Slow down. Sorry. I'm excited. Sorry. So this was the final death attributed to the ship. Kind of. The ship had one more last surprise. A few days after this incident, the newspaper started running a story. Here's what was said in the article from one of the riveters that was taking apart the ship. He said, We were breaking into a compartment in the inner shell of the port side when a shriek went up and stopped all work. We found a skeleton inside the ship's hull. Mm, Just one? Yes. It was the skeleton of the old riveter who went missing. So that's exactly what happened to the riveter, at least one of them, because I don't know if the other skeleton was ever found. Ah. Uh, well, at least they can lay him to rest, I hope. I guess. Wow. So that's the story of the Great Eastern. All right, Tracy, we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and we're going to be back to talk about the Star of India. Okay. Tracy, is fascinating... As the story of the Great Eastern was. This one is fascinating for a completely different reason. You love the movie Titanic. I do. So you obviously love a good stowaway story. Sure. Which is kind of what we have here. We talked about superstition and the seas and all that stuff a little bit earlier. But did you know that seamen, the kind on ships, by the way, (laughs) believe that the Death and danger could be predicted by the color of the sunrise and the sunset. No way. Red at night, a sailor delight. Red in the morning, a sailor's warning. Oh. How about that? I like it. They were poets. They were. A death at sea was also held in a, a more ominous view than a death on land. And the Star of India... It's going to have its share. It was launched in 1863 at Ramsey on the Isle of Man. That's overseas. I was going to say, I've never heard of it. They have a big concert there every year. Are you serious? Yes, like a big music festival. Oh. It's over in uh, Great Britain and stuff. Oh, wow. The ship originally was named Euterpe. You what? You Huh? What'd you say? Euterpe. You're ter- oh, you terpe. You terpe. Okay. From the Greek mythological uh, goddess that we'll get into here in a little bit. She was often depicted holding a flute or a panpipe to kind of show her commitment and connection to music. She was the goddess of music and poetry. So the ship would eventually be renamed the Star of India. It was a 205-foot Three-masted ship. So it's a little bit smaller than the other one. Sounds right. like, yeah. More than half the size. The ship transported thousands of passengers from England to New Zealand. And on one of these trips, an 11-year-old boy decided to stow away in search of a better home. Oh. Now, let me say this, because I like to point these things out. I've seen other articles that said he was 14. I've seen another article that said he was 12. I'm sticking with 11 because that seems to be what most... Middle of the road. Well, that's what the consensus was. Most of the stories said 11. 11, okay. Now, with that being said, his name, according to most of what I saw, was Oswald Letts. Okay. But I did see different names out there that were nowhere close. So. They, they called him Ozzy for short. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. All right, so first of all, how bad is your home life that you hop on a damn ship to get out of the country? Yeah, it must have been pretty bad. I do feel sorry for a lot of kids yeah. when their home life sucks. I mean, people do that with cruises and stuff, but it's only for like a couple of weeks. Yeah, well. Kind of leave, leave themselves behind. Oswald didn't come by himself, though. 
he actually brought two friends with him. And the three were found in the ship's holding area several days into the trip. So, Tracy, what do you think the captain did after finding these three boys that were stowaways? Well, I hope he had mercy on them and fed them a good meal, put them up in a nice room. That's what I say. Was he mean? No. He actually made them work for their food, though. Well, that's all right. For, for the most part. Most of the time, the kids just played tag up on the ship's deck with the other kids who were out there. So there were other kids on the ship. They were like um, uh, children of the paying customers. Mm -hmm. So there was a group of kids on there that they could all play around. Oh, that's good. So they all played together. The game that they liked to play the most? Spin the top. Oh. Spin the what? Top. Remember on Titanic when they had that thing and they pulled the string and the thing went on the the thing? Wow, that was descriptive. (laughs) You should really consider writing a book. Okay, so they played... Tag. Okay. If you don't know what tag is. and most, uh, You must be living under a rock. I'll say it right now. Most most do. But it was very similar to what we know today. One kid would be it and the other ones would run around and you'd chase one of them and you'd slap them on the back or something and say tag. The difference was back then. No, they wouldn't. they say you're it. Yeah, tag, you're it. Oh, you didn't finish it. Well, whatever. They know it. They get it. The only real difference here is that when one of the kids would tag the other, they did so by marking an S with their finger on their back. I don't know why. Hmm. I don't know why it was an S, not a T. I don't know, but that's what they did. When the ship was about halfway across the Pacific Ocean, Oswald Letts decided he wanted to play a more deadly game. He was showing off in front of all his little friends and let's remember that there is a saying on ships. You always have one hand for yourself and one hand for the ship. Tracy, do you know why that would be the same? I don't know. It's because sudden waves can rock the boat and oh. could possibly even throw you overboard. Oh, well, so you should always sense. be holding on to mm-hmm. something. I got you. That makes a lot of sense. As Oswald was showing off, He climbed all the way up to the tallest mast. He was yelling down, look at me, look at me. He held on to the rope as best he could, but that's when the wind kicked up. The mast started going back and forth. Oh, how scary. Back and forth. Oswald's grip started to weaken. Then a big wave hit and Oswald lost his grip. My gosh. He fell over 100 feet. To the deck below. Oh, he landed on the deck? Yes. Oh. Guess what the date was? Uh, I don't know. June 29th, 1884. My birthday? I'm sorry, Oswald. No, it ain't year and all, you turd. As you can imagine, this would not be the end of Oswald Letts. At least, not the spirit form. Somewhere on the Pacific Ocean, the young boy found a new way to play aboard the Star of India. During the future voyages, passengers and crew started to notice that something wasn't quite right on board the ship, especially in the ship's holding department, where young Oswald, Oswald, (laughs) where young Oswald was eventually discovered. Some reports the feeling of a presence, well, they were, well, at least what they thought, were alone. Others have heard giggling of a child in empty rooms. But the most chilling events come from those who felt the figure S drawn on their back. Oh. oh. This would even happen when people were sleeping They would be awakened by an S being drawn on their arm or their stomach, but no one in the room. Most assured that Oswald is just playing tag with them, so they're excited. Unfortunately, not all the hauntings on board of the Star of India are so playful. The ship is still currently in use, by the way. It's an educational ship. Oh, good. And uh, there are definitely some stories that have happened since... It quit sailing. In the first mate's cabin, some say that 
there is a more evil presence lurking. Legend has it that a drunken passenger, Army Captain McBarrett, he was very suicidal, and in a frenzy, he cut his own throat. Oh, my gosh. He was found, and the ship's surgeon was summoned. That's hard to say. Mm-hmm. So, surgeon stepped up. What? I So, I guess he was st- didn't die yet? The surgeon stitched up the man's throat, and he was put in the first mate's cabin. But sometime during the night, the man ripped out the stitches, and he bled to death. What is wrong with him? Eighty years later, there was a volunteer on board the Star of India by the name of Karen Wyman. And she was staying on board the ship because not only was she a volunteer, but she got to sleep there. She was getting settled in for the night, ready for bed, in that first mate's cabin. Mm. She said it was a cold night, so she put on some warm clothes and climbed into the bunk. She was trying to fall asleep when suddenly it felt like someone was poking the top of her sleeping bag. She was terrified and frozen. She said it felt like someone was trying to pull the sleeping bag off of her. She quickly set up, but no one was there. So she spent the rest of the night watching shadows from the water dance around the walls. Yeah. She sure as hell couldn't go back to sleep. I'm sure. The next morning, another volunteer actually told her about the events that took place 80 years before in that room. Oh, it had been 80 years? Yeah, when the guy did the... Did that throat thing? Yeah. There's some other stories from the Star of India that sits in the uh, water in San Diego. I don't think I've mentioned where it was. In 1909, the Star was making a return trip from Alaska. There was a Chinese fisherman who was guiding the massive anchor chain into position when he lost his balance and fell into the chain locker. Ugh. The fellow cruisemen were unable to actually hear his screams, so he was crushed to death by a thousand pounds of cold steel. Mm. Now, there have been some rumors that the man was actually murdered and was kind of thrown into the locker and crushed just to kind of destroy evidence. Ugh, that's just horrifying. Visitors on a ship have claimed to feel cold spots in a very humid room. Others have claimed to feel a presence in that room. And it's pretty commonly believed that any activity in the locker would be that of the fisherman. I just just cannot imagine. uh, This ship is, like, these ships are really dangerous, right? (laughs) Right. There's, like, not, not even a calm way to die. It's all horrific and horrid. Tracy, I said there was only two stories at the beginning, but I I decided to add a third shorter story. Okay. So let's end with this one. We've spent a lot of time talking about superstition on this episode. Well, there's a fishing village along the uh, central coast of California named Morro Bay. The ocean dominates all aspects of life there. The town is kind of known for violent waves out in the ocean. Back in the late 1990s, there was a sailor. I'm not making this up. His name was Popeye Thorne. Hmm. I'm sure Popeye was probably a nickname. He had a very chilling experience. He came face to face with a famous phantom of the sea. So he and two others were on a fishing boat. They were caught in this ferocious storm. He was on watch the first night up on the top of the deck. And he said the winds came from the front of the ship. He looked back at the ocean and he saw that a wave was coming down and it hit and landed so hard that it caused the ship to shudder. And it broke a lot of the equipment on board the boat. But it didn't like flip it over? No. They couldn't turn around or they'd actually be going right into the the major heart of the storm. So 
He was desperately trying to keep the boat from crashing. He had his arm wrapped around the pinnacle. And just like we talked about earlier, one arm holds. Yep. And... All right. Got to hold on. He said a face started appearing into the pinnacle. It was red with white highlights. He said a finger actually came out, pointed at him, and said, I want you. That's Uncle Sam. <laughs> well, Popeye yelled at his at his crew, and he said, um, I'm coming back down. I don't know who was piloting the ship, but Good he Lord, went back Good Lord, that's downstairs. bizarre. He felt like he was going crazy up there. He didn't tell anybody about what happened. What? He was afraid to. They were eventually picked up a hundred miles north of where they had started out at. The boat that picked them up was a Danish freighter. They had seen their very last flare that had went up. So several years later, Popeye was reading a report about, you know, a good luck Norwegian sailor. His name was Clow Botterman. The myth goes that if you are even visited by Clow Botterman, that neither you nor your crew would be taken by the sea. After they were rescued, they found out that they were the only full crew to make it through that storm alive. Well, then why did he say, I want you? I guess he was picking, telling him that he was going to survive. Because oh. Popeye, come to believe, was from Norway and he believes he was visited by Clower. Good Lord, that's awesome. So, anyways. well, that was very nice. So that's the story we got from uh, some haunted ships. Man, those are crazy. All right. So with that being done, we're going to take another quick break, and then we will be back with Will to tell you some stories. Tracy, real quick, we just want to remind everybody about the cruise. Jump on that because uh, you're running out of time. Yeah, come on, guys. The more, the merrier. You can go to Hillbilly this, Horse. This Story. ship will not be haunted. Yeah, <laughs> but we can't say that for sure. But go to hillbillyhorrorstories.com. You can actually get all the information there. Yes. And you can get information on our live event for August, which will be St. Augustine. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. And I forgot to say Happy Mother's Day to all you beautiful ladies out there and gentlemen that Take the place of the mom. That identifies moms. And we appreciate that you all do so much for your kids. They're a blessing for sure. And cherish your moms if they're here because mine's not and I miss her terribly. But I hope you guys had a great Mother's Day. All right. What do you got going on over there besides that? Um, I have some iTunes reviews. Thank you guys so much. Rose Amy Nice. Now, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be said, because it could be Rose Am I Nice, but I'm pretty sure it's Amy. But we love you, honey. Thank you so much for your review. Paul W., Susan Bowman, thank you, beautiful, and Mojo Lobster. Thank you guys for all your time you take out to do our reviews. We appreciate you all so, so much. It's such a good help, and we love hearing from our friends. We didn't have any Patreon supporters this week. And uh, just a reminder that we did put a virtual tip jar on the website. All right, Tracy, let's listen to Will, William, Willie. He goes by many names. Oh, right. Good for him. And uh, we'll be right back. Hey, guys, I've got a special guest for you today. And this guest actually comes uh, through a very funny chance meeting. So one day, Tracy and I were stopping at a bank. We were getting ready to go uh, somewhere. I can't remember where it was, but we were going to be, oh, I know we were going to watch a Kentucky game up in Orlando, which was about an hour away. And we stop at the bank to get some money out. And there, there's a gentleman and his wife. They see our car. They see the Hillbilly Horror Stories. And he says, hey, I'm into horror too. We, we struck up a conversation and uh, we've talked a few times. And then they actually came out to our show in Casadega. And uh, had, we all had a great time together. 
So now I'm bringing on an author, self-published author, I should say, W.C. Fillmore. Hey, thanks for coming on, Willie. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. So you have a plethora of books out there. You kind of go uh, with the theme of a dark urban mythos. Tell me about the, the name itself and... and your writing style in general. Okay. Uh, Dark Urban Mythos comes from <clears throat> the tales you hear around uh, dumpsters and neighborhoods and the neighborhood bar or something. You know, you ever you ever sat somewhere and you heard somebody tell a story and it was just so intriguing that you kind of like had to go, what? Is that true? Did that actually happen? <clears throat> and so I started... Um, Kind of jotting a lot of these stories down, and for, I'd have to say from the late '90s <clears throat> until a couple of a uh, um, couple of probably about the early thousands is when I decided, you know what, maybe I should take these stories and try and put them together in a in a book. And so that's what I did. I uh, started writing these stories down, and they're all kind of like dark kind of dark fantasy, ghost stories, uh, ghouls, you know, stuff like that, uh, cursed objects. So that's that's pretty much where the books come from. <clears throat> so you were tell you were telling me earlier that you've kind of gotten these stories from all over the place. Yeah. And one of the stories uh, is about a gun. And uh, uh, this gun apparently is pretty well traveled. Uh, but it, obviously, it's got a little uh, chaos wrapped into it. So tell us a, a little bit about that story. Okay. The uh, story about the gun. It started, uh, I heard, overheard somebody. We were talking. We are taking a ride somewhere. And the guy was talking about um, his uncle worked at a police station. And they had gotten a call about a murder. And they couldn't find the gun, but as the week went on, other killings happened, and you come to find out, once they finally got to you come to find out it's from the same gun. Now, I okay. expanded it to more people, but it was only three people in the original story. And then it was a gun that went around and traveled from from. You know, from owner to owner, like somebody would take it, use it, throw it away. Somebody would take it, and <clears throat> I have it where kids find it. Um, so you've taken uh, you've taken a, a story that you know to be true, and yeah. you've you've kind of used that as a basis <laughs> for the right. story that you put in the book. Right, that's what I did. I I I took it and I enhanced it a little bit. And I took uh, stories that I knew about. I took the first couple of stories from the, what the guy told me, and then I just expanded the story. What's um, the craziest? What's the craziest thing somebody's told you? Oh wow! Mm. Well, I, I can tell you a, a story. I live by the uh, Daytona Beach Golf Club. Okay. okay. And. Me and friends used to play football on a on a on an acreage of that golf course. We used to get run off all the time. Yeah, you know, we were like <laughs> eight, nine, ten years old, you know. And we played football, and we and we get run off. So uh, uh, one day, one of the golfers got struck by lightning and was killed. So me and a friend, we used to go at night to the golf course. And we would go into the pond and we would collect golf balls. And then we would sell it back to the golfer. Yeah, it was like a nickel. Sometimes you get a big spender. You might spend 10, 10 cents. But that's when comic books were 25 cents. You remember? Right. Yeah. So you didn't need that much, you know. I mean, we were kids, so you know, our 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 sites weren't on a, weren't on a big business, you know what I mean? We were on candy and comic books. That was it. Right. So uh, one day, uh, we I, I was going to the golf course, and my friend says, hey, man, 
uh, a guy on the golf course told me that you can find more balls at this one uh, pond. I said, oh, yeah, what guy told you that? He goes, oh, yeah, he, he had on this orange shirt and da, da, da. I said, oh, yeah? Um, when was this? He goes, oh, the guy was up. I said, dude, nobody golfs at night. He goes, yeah, 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 I'm telling you, the guy told me. Now, he was right. We went in there. We went in. We found a whole lot of golf balls. But when we went back to the house and looked in the paper and saw that uh, uh, article on the guy that got hit by lightning, it was the guy that got hit by lightning. Nice. That's what he, he, goes, he goes, that's the guy. I said, no, 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 that's not the guy. That guy's been dead <laughs> for like, like a week. That, that could not have been the same guy. And that's what he told me. Who would thought that ghost put so many balls into the uh, the water? I guess. <laughs> hey. Apparently, his golf game did not improve in the afterlife. No, no, it did not. No, no, that golf how course many, was uh, crazy. There how were many no books alligators did you... and dogs and all kind of stuff going on there. I was going to say I wouldn't be going in any of these water areas in Florida. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gotten worse now. How many books do you have out as we speak? Okay, I have two novels, two 400-page novels, and I have three short story um, quick reads, I call them, because there's two stories in each book. Uh, this, each story takes you about 20, 25 minutes to read. I like to sell those because, you know, people are on the go. I mean, people want to read, but they're like, I don't want to read a giant book. I just want to read something that's good, and then I want to, you know, go do my thing. So I I made those three books, and I, I'll I'll show you. Uh, that's one of them right there. It's uh that's my first one, and the stories yeah. in that one, the one about the gun, and then I have one about a a tree that grows money in this neighborhood. And uh, uh, the locals, the uh, little girl finds out about it. She starts giving the money out, and it attracts bad elements. I won't tell you the whole thing, but, yeah, it attracts bad elements. Uh, I have another book that uh, it is about when I went up to New York, uh, I went to go see some friends of mine, and they had a uh, there was a big funeral going on for this. He was a pimp. Okay. My friend says, "Oh, you got to go down. We got to go down and see this funeral." Like, man, I don't, I don't want to go to a funeral. You know, I don't want to go there. Right. It's not, no, no, we got to go to this funeral. You're gonna, you're just gonna trip out. Well, he was right. The dude, this this guy was buried in a casket shaped like a Cadillac. It nice. was shaped like a Cadillac. I mean, it had the, it had the windows. It had the little remember the old boomerang antenna. He, oh yeah. Yeah, it had one of those on it. And one of my stories is about this funeral for this pimp and these two um, dancers, exotic dancers, I'll call them. And they you. they decide to I call it I call it a um, gold diggers. And they go to rob this guy's um, casket. Because when he was buried, this is this was a tradition in in big cities back then for for I don't want to say pimp, but you know, for people of prominence, they would take money and they would clip it in the casket to your lapel. They would leave jewelry, they would leave rings. When we went, you know, you did the little walk around and you walk around. And I'm looking in that casket, I'm like, holy crap, it, it, there's more money in this casket than I got at home. And uh, so I, it, a story just popped into my head. What if these two girls, what if these girls used to work for him and they see all this cash and they want to go get get out of town? So they decide to dig it up. And, well, things don't always go, go as, as planned. You know, the, uh, what is it, men and mice? Yeah. 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 So that's where I got I like that. 
All I can tell you is if I'd have been at that funeral, I'd have been hugging him more than any corpse has ever been hugged. Each time I'd be coming back with a little something uh, different. <laughs> I, his, and his color was uh, lavender. So the, the casket was lavender. He had on a lavender suit. Everybody, all his all his former ladies had on lavender dresses and stuff. And it was just, it was very, very over the top. Very, very over the top. Very over the top. But I, I, I just never forgot it. It's very strange. Very. Yeah, strange. I, I I can't imagine that'd be something you'd forget very easily. <laughs> right, right. So I, I do a lot of I, like I've I've gone to uh, it while while I was in uh, Mobile, Alabama. I worked in Mobile, Alabama, uh, working a forklift, loading Tyson chicken onto Russian freighters. So believe me, you hear a lot of stories from these Russians. Oh, I bet. Oh yeah, so uh, I, I I was doing that, but there's a bookstore downtown Mobile, this old old bookstore. I went in, you know, I I'm from out of town, so I you know just a local. So I went to check it out, and uh, there was a book in the back by Zora Neale Hurston, and it was a book on Haiti rituals, voodoo. And zombies. So I was like, wow, I, 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 oh, I've got to buy this book. The guy would not sell me the book. He would not sell it to me. He goes, that book, that, that's, not a, that's not a book you want to buy. He's like, well, why not? He goes, I, I, don't, I don't want to sell it. I said, okay, well, can I read it at least? He goes, oh, yeah, you can read it. So they had little couches in the back, stuff like that. So I sat there and read it. But one day I asked him, uh, can I use your uh, copying machine. I got some things I got to copy. Well, I took pages <laughs> from that book and I Xeroxed them while he wasn't, you know, paying attention. And I used those pages to write this book called Dark Paradise of the Dead. And I used the actual rituals that she saw in those books. And I used the rituals. I talk about the zombies more because. Real zombies don't want bright. Okay, I'm sorry to bust everybody's bubble. I know that's <laughs> that's what we've been used to. Zombies are beasts of burden. Okay, they're they're made to to uh, uh, they're made to serve you. Okay, and that's what they do. They whatever you want them to do, that's what a zombie does. And a lot of her writings were that they were using zombies to harvest fields. Uh, in Haiti, at night, like a farmer would, would he would a farmer would buy. Uh, we would have his land, and he would he would go to a local voodoo doctor, and he would employ zombies. And at night, he would pay the guy. He would go to bed at night, and when he wake up in the morning, his fields would be harvest, harvested. But he used zombie labor. She wrote. Intricately about uh, uh, where loved ones would would like be passing in the night and see a, a dead daughter or a dead sister out in the field working. Man, yeah, and she wrote it all down. She wrote the rituals. She wrote how they became zombies. She wrote uh, everything associated with with it and 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 all the trials and things that they had to go through in order to make a person like that because there's a whole ritual you have to go through and then there's certain ingredients that you have to use in order to make a person into a doctor and so she, in this book she detailed it all and it's from uh i want to say it's probably from the 40s the early 40s i don't even know if it's still in print I can't even t tell you the name of it, but it was it was written by Zora Neale Hurston, who was a famous writer from Eatonville, which is only a couple miles from. You're hearing you're hearing um, Daytona right now, or yep. Okay, that's only Eatonville is only uh, it's just before you get to Orlando, and it's okay. a small it's a small town. But she was born there. She went up to New York and she became a famous Renaissance writer. Well, she got a job with the U.S. government to go and survey um, 
islands in the bah in the Bahamas and the uh, uh, Caribbean. And one of her stops was Haiti, and she wrote this whole book on Haiti culture and and everything. So I used all that stuff that she saw, and I put it into a story, and uh, it's pretty creepy. If I, yeah, I used to talk. I used to talk to John E.L. Tenney. We had him on the show one time, but he had a podcast out of experiences that he had. And one of them, mm -hmm. and of course it's been forever since I've listened to it, so I'll, I'll, I won't know a lot of the details, but right. there was a there was a friend of his uh, or somebody who was doing some, I guess he was doing some work for, paranormal right. work. And he took him home to meet his mother or grandmother. And she basically was teaching him about voodoo, Mm. All, all, yeah. she was originally from haiti yeah. and yeah. she got on the subject of of she didn't say zombies i forgot the term she used for them mm. but she took him to meet this man who was like a janitor of a school right and the guy was almost like um like just somebody that had a really low iq you know what i mean mm. like maybe he yeah. had some brain damage or right. from an accident or right. something but apparently, uh, I guess they they talked about having a coin that mm -hmm. you would have your coin, and if somebody ever got that coin, they could control you. Whoa! And Ooh. that's what the situation was with him. Oh wow! He had control over him, and wow. as long as she had control over him, that's pretty much what he was. He didn't used to be like, like you know, the slow janitor. Right. He used to be somebody right. else, but right, yeah. right. Once you, once you, well, in her book, once you become a zombie, you're, you're a totally different person. There's no turning back. Now, she, in that book, she actually had a picture of a zombie, a woman who had been found uh, working the fields by her family, and her family like just kidnapped her. They said, you know, we we don't care if she's a zombie or not. They took her to a monastery. And she stayed at that monastery, I guess, until she died. Or, but but she stayed basically a zombie. She never, you know, reverted back to herself. She was she was always trying to clean. She was always trying to, you know, like if somebody would walk in the room, she would jump up and just start cleaning. And, you know, that's stuff like that. So, yeah, I tried to use I try to use real elements. Things, like I say, things that I've heard or things that I've read and, and then thread a story together. So I know there's a bunch of stories in Haiti about people coming back 12, 15 oh, yeah. years later yeah. and not really yeah. having much memory of what's went on. Wow. And... Yep. Yeah. And, th and that's uh, kind of a, a underlining um, a story, like a B storyline in my book. It's a girl. And she finds her sister and she takes her to the monastery and she's trying to get her to come back to, to life. And uh, um, the evil uh, uh, plantation owner uh, is is uh, making people into zombies and she's trying to, to get her uh, cured in this in the story. So it's 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 yeah. We're talking to author W.C. Fillmore about his books that are all part of the uh, dark urban mythos. How can people buy the books, first of all? Okay. Uh, you can buy my books through Amazon. They're all available through Amazon. You've got the first uh, three volumes of the dark urban mythos, which is Fillmore's double dose of dark urban mythos. Uh, volume one, volume two, and volume three. And then the novels, the first novel, which is Dark Paradise of the Dead, which is a zombie one. And then I have one of a circus uh, called uh, Maxwell's Traveling Gypsy Circus. And I got that story was um, one time, and don't ask me why, I volunteered to work at this carnival, this little <laughs> traveling carnival. It was a really small, it wasn't that big, a little small Ferris wheel, a little, you know, some game cars, uh, some games. It was it was all a rip off. You know? It was just it was just made to, to make money. But like all carnivals. Uh, right. <laughs> so I traveled with them for a minute and the people there were gypsies. And well at least at least they called themselves. 
And uh, they would tell me, you know, little gypsy stories and stuff like that. So I decided to put all that into uh, into that book. And it's called, like I said, it's called Maxwell's Traveling Gypsy Circus. Uh, I end up leaving after only a couple of, I don't I'd say almost a month I was there. But what they were doing was in, when they got ready to pay you, they would take out for food and lodging. Yeah. yeah. So the more food you ate, the more they would take out. So I had a, I don't, I, another guy that came with me, he complained about it. They end up, um, you know, kind of uh, jacking him up. So when he got jacked up, I was like, okay, it's time for me to leave. And I end up still on a bicycle, riding down 95 to go to the next town to go to a bus terminal there and catch a bus uh, back home. How long ago was this? Woo, this was 2002 or three. Two, about 2000, I'd say 2003. Yeah, 2003. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I got some good stories out of it, though, about curses. Uh, uh, there's one curse where uh, it's, it's called the cat people curse. Where they you'd make love if you were if you were cursed a cat person if you made love to somebody you would turn into a cat and kill that person the only way to turn back into a human is to kill your lover. Huh. Well, that's uh, that's putting a lot on a relationship. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And they could only make love to their own kind. If they made love to anybody else, they would transform. And then the only way to transform back is through blood. So, Crazy what you can learn at a gypsy circus. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. W.C. Fillmore, what is a good way people can follow you on social media? Uh, you can go to my website, which is wcfillmore.com. Um. I have a Facebook account. It's uh, William Fillmore. Facebook <clears throat> at Facebook.com, I guess it is. And uh, go to my website. At the bottom, there's a little thing. and You can contact me. We can talk, converse. Hey, get to know each other. That way you can read, that way you can read my stories and then come back and, and, and ask me stuff about it. Awesome. Dude, it has been fantastic meeting you uh at the event in uh casadega oh that was and, great that yeah was great. So tell everybody a little about that because not everybody has been to a live show you guys uh came out and were, our, were part of our special guests uh sitting in the audience even though this was kind of a laid-back timid kind of show what were your right. thoughts well i, I love the ambiance of uh us meeting in casadega um, Casadega is, I don't know if anybody, I don't know how many of your viewers are, but, but it is world, world known for being a spiritual enclave. Okay. Well, that's the new name for it. Cause when I was younger, it was a witch hangout. That's what it was. A witch right. hangout. Oh, there's witches at that Casadega. You got to watch Casadega. Don't go to there, Casadega. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was the, cause I lived in D-Land for about eight years. And it's very close to Cassidy, only like what ten minutes, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. And uh, I went, I went there one time to see the graveyard. I don't know if you've ever been to the graveyard out there in Cassidy. Yeah, the uh, one with the devil's chair. Right. Right. Yeah. So I just went out for that because that's like I say, that's I, I don't I'm not gonna say world famous, but definitely national famous for being a. Um, uh, witch slash spiritual retreat. <laughs> and uh, I, I love that, that the fact that you you had it in one of these old rooms, you know, you can almost, and every time that door kept opening and closing, it seemed like there was a ghost coming in <laughs> and out. I mean, you yeah. guys could not keep that door, that the two glass doors, you could not keep that glass door closed. Yeah, I think when people were opening up the front door, 
oh, to the okay. uh, the hotel, that pressure was coming through there, kicking oh, that door okay. open because sometimes okay. it had some force behind it. Oh, okay, I I vote for the for the ghost. I think it was the ghost coming in and out. Well, that they sounds more the, They were coming to see the podcast too. <laughs> But it was great. Hey. Uh, two young women who did the um, uh, Everything Goes Boo or something like that. His, history Goes Bump. He's close. Okay. History <laughs> Goes Bump. Yeah. Yeah. They were very good. And then they uh, they had the tape recording of the ghost speaking in the uh, – they're right there in D-Land, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The old – I, I want to say the old um, – I forgot where they were at. Was it it's the a old, hotel, right? Oh, the hotel. That's it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I used to live right down the street from that place. Right around down, I'd say about three or four blocks from there. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, they did a great job. And then, of course, you guys came on. And uh, and it gave me a feel of, of, of what your show is about. Yeah, we just try to have fun at the live events. That's what it's about. Oh, it's. It's a, it's about good. a party atmosphere. Yeah, the food was good. The drinks were good, too. Well, Willie, thank you so much for coming on, buddy. It's been a blast, and uh, we can't wait no to – we need to hook up and do dinner or something sometime. We live too close yes, to each we other. Should. we should. Just hit me up anytime you want to. And uh, I hope you enjoy – I think I gave you a couple books, right? You did. You gave me one of the short story ones for me because you know that I don't like to read very often. Uh, and, then, and then one of the novels for Tracy. Okay. All right. I sure did. Okay. I hope you enjoy them. All right, brother. I know I will. Thank you so All much. Right, I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, and uh, everybody who's listening, hello. All right, guys. That wraps it up for this week. We hope you enjoyed that show. Thank you so much for everything you do for us. Thank you guys so much. We hope you all have a blessed week.